Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the RSIS CAPS workshop on ASEAN resilience and European strategic autonomy, converging operational concepts. Good morning too to our friends in Europe. I'm Amalina from RSIS and I have the pleasure of being your MC for today. Before we start the event, please note that this workshop will be recorded and it may be shared publicly online. Without further ado, I would now like to invite Ambassador Marc Abunsu, Ambassador of France to Singapore, to deliver his opening remarks. Ambassador Abunsu, please. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me first express my uh, deep gratitude to Ambassador Hong Ken uh, Yong who, uh, for his uh, constant support uh, to uh, joint initiatives uh, with the French Embassy. Uh, my thanks also go to Ambassador Piorco, to Ambassador Peno. I'm really grateful to them for their participation uh, today to our webinar. And I want also to uh, express my thanks to um, the Center for Policy Planning of the French Ministry for European and uh, Foreign Affairs, represented today by Mr. Gurvan Lebras. And also uh, to, for uh, my thanks to Professor Ralph Emers, the Dean of uh, RSIS, both uh, are uh, co-organizers uh, with the French Embassy of this uh, webinar. I will uh, keep it very short, but just uh, um, a word on this concept of um, strategic autonomy. First point, I think that there is a greater awareness among Europeans of the need to build uh, this uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, strategic autonomy, it's a process, it's incremental, uh, but clearly there is this greater awareness due to several reasons. Uh, I would mention maybe the change of US doctrines in terms of uh, engagement. Also, um, the fact that there is a strategic environment which has also uh, a change characterized by a greater un uncertainty. And uh, maybe also the fact that great powers uh, try to build the sphere of influence. And I would also mention, I mean, the security challenges uh, that EU is confronted uh, with uh, terrorism, uh, instability in the neighboring countries, and so on. Second point, there are sometimes misperceptions about strategic autonomy, uh, this concept. First, misperception that it is at the expense of the transatlantic uh, relationship and that there is a zero-sum game uh, between uh, strategic autonomy and sometimes people put the transatlantic uh, relationship and NATO. Second misperception, uh, this idea that it's only focused on defense and security matters. And third misperception that it is sometimes with a hidden agenda, which is to favor protectionism. So I think that uh, now it is a, a concept uh, which has been used increasingly by uh, EU institutions, by EU member states, and that it's clear uh, that uh, this concept does also serve uh, the transatlantic relation. Uh, it was well uh, noted in the last joint communique between President Macron and President Biden, uh, where it was stated that uh, there was a recognition uh, of the need to enable a stronger and more capable European defense in complementarity with uh, NATO. Uh, I think it's uh, also well uh, now stated that uh, it's not limited to security and defense agenda, but that covers a wide spectrum of activities, including health, uh, digital economy, uh, finance, uh, 5G, for instance, and also that uh, this strategic autonomy is uh, has a, a, an agenda in terms of sovereignty uh, and to guarantee a level playing field based on reciprocity. And this is why you have, for instance, tools such as uh, screening of foreign investment and, and so on. So this approach uh, are based on strategic autonomy is multidimensional, not, not focused only on health security. It's based on cooperation. It's based on the principle of inclusive, inclusivity. And therefore we see a strong convergence with uh, ASEAN. So we think that there was an opportunity and that this uh, today's seminar is very uh, timely to explore further together this convergence in the different uh, areas uh, whether uh, maritime security, cyber governance, and others. And to do that within the framework of the EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific, and also ahead of the French uh, presidency 
uh, of the EU first semester 2022. Uh, during uh, this uh, uh, EU presidency, France will put the implementation of the EU strategy as a top priority. So I stop here and uh, I'm uh, uh, thanking uh, every one of you to participate to this uh, uh, seminar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I would now like to invite Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, to deliver his opening remarks. Ambassador Ong, please. Thank you, Amalina. Thank you to all the friends and uh, experts joining us in this uh, online event today. I am happy to be part of this learning process. There are so many things uh, I have to learn about the European Union and its concept of strategic autonomy, as well as the resilience of the European Union to all the changes that we are witnessing in the world today are all very important to our work at the S. Roger Adam School of International Studies. I want to add that uh, as far as the ASEAN and European Union partnership is concerned, we have seen the upgrading of this long-standing partnership to that level of strategic partnership. This happened towards the end of 2020. And I want to say that as a former Secretary General of ASEAN, I am very happy that we have now arrived at this new level of uh, working together. The EU has always been ASEAN's major, major partner, especially in areas that uh, uh, are now important for our ASEAN community building. European Union's experience in many of these, uh, what we call community connecting and community expanding uh, areas will be valuable for our ASEAN community going forward. Today, we have a very competitive international environment Principally, the big powers are becoming more active in jostling for their respective interests and trying to position themselves in a manner which we have not seen previously. So a grouping like ASEAN has much to learn as we look at European Union countries and how the European diplomacy is organized across the global uh, arena. For ASEAN, we are always trying our best to avoid having Southeast Asia getting embroiled in big power rivalry or big power competition. As we have learned from the 1970s, uh, 80s and early 90s, such kind of geopolitical development in Southeast Asia uh, are not good for us. So we are now looking at China and the United States becoming more embroiled with each other's activities in this region. We are aware that Southeast Asia is a very critical maritime zone because there are many important sea lanes of communication, a lot of trade between East and West is transacted through the seas and ocean around Southeast Asia. So therefore, we are trying our best not to get entangled with any of these competitive dynamics. But we know that each of our ASEAN member states has its own consideration and interests. And it is unavoidable that we may be caught up with some of these doing and flowing between the two big powers, namely China and the United States of America. We hope to learn a bit more from this afternoon's discussion uh, with uh, our European colleagues, and perhaps we can find some way to balance our own ASEAN programs and activities going forward. To us, 
we have dialogue partnership with all the big countries, with European Union, and with other regional powers. They are all very important to us. And we try not to, what the media call, take side in any of these uh, uh, engagements with each other. So this strategic partnership between ASEAN and the EU can now be much more exciting as we look at the issue of strategic autonomy, its relationship with the other big powers, and its relationship with recent development in our region. We have now newer things called mini-laterals and other kind of uh, configuration which would be complicated to the layman. But I think these are all important activities which hopefully this online seminar will help to clarify and allow us to take a more optimistic approach to all the doing and flowing we are witnessing today. I will stop here. Thank you all for being part of this sharing and dialogue. We hope that we will get a bit more understanding of our respective concerns and interests in the maritime domain, in the cyberspace, and in the general diplomatic effort that all of us wish to undertake in order to maintain our own respective sovereignty and freedom of action. Thank you very much for participating and for having me. Over to you, Amelinda. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Christophe Penault, Ambassador of France for the Indo-Pacific, will now deliver his opening remarks. Ambassador Penault, please. Thank you. Well, good, good afternoon and uh, good morning to our uh, European friends. Um, I'm very grateful to the RISS and, uh, and the French Embassy for um, organizing this uh, webinar, and I'm very pleased to be part of the discussion. I will cover three items. Uh, one is uh, AUKUS, which is, uh, I think, closely related to uh, the title of today's discussion. And then I will uh, cover the French and European vision and the strong similarities with the ASEAN outlook. Um, AUKUS, um, well, a, a very surprising announcement for all of us, I think. Neither prior consultation nor prior information, um, not the normal way of handling things between allies and partner, I would say, um, because partnerships are certainly based on openness and transparency. Um, in our strategic partnership with Australia and the intergovernmental agreement that we signed in 2016, uh, we had consultations mechanisms, um, but a ministerial two plus two took place 15 days before the AUKUS announcement and nothing was told to us. But I shall not dwell on that because we need to move on uh, so we started the process of restoring trust with the US and we are making very good progress. Uh, our two presidents, as you know, talked uh, uh, twice. Um, and there is a, a recognition from the American side that things could have been managed in a better way. And very important, a positive appreciation of the role that the EU can play in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is welcome because, uh, as you know, the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific was published uh, just the day after the AUKUS uh, announcement. For us, the AUKUS development was a clear demonstration of the need for a European strategic autonomy. Uh, as Marc uh, Abbasou uh, has, has just said, the French position about that is sometimes misrepresented. What we mean really is that our interests are of course greatly convergent, but that they may sometimes differ. And by defending them, we do not seek to weaken the transatlantic link, but we enhance it 
by keeping open the possibility of complementary approaches. So it's to us, it's a reinforcement of uh, efficiency. Now, uh, a few words about our bilateral um, relationship with Australia. It, it will take much more time because it goes far beyond um, the cancellation of the contract, submarine contract. Um, it will take time to repair our relationship because trust has been broken. The way of our partnership was cancelled was uh, brutal and uh, I would say deceitful. So these things cannot be as before and we, what we need is a complete reassessment of our bilateral cooperation and this will uh, uh, be um, <clears throat> our work uh, today uh, and in the coming weeks and months. Uh, it will be difficult, but uh, let us hope that we can resume sometime in the future a, a good cooperation between our two countries. So now, what kind of impact uh, did it make on the French and EU Indo-Pacific strategy? Well, one thing is very clear. We maintain the course of our Indo-Pacific strategy, and we shall continue to reinforce our engagement and our partnerships uh, in the region. The fundamentals of our strategy remain the same. We are part of this region with territories in the two oceans on which we maintain military assets and which also constitute uh, cooperation platforms with neighboring countries, for instance, in uh, HADR or in scientific research. Our strategic and economic interests, our interdependence with the region are still there in particular, the need to provide a response to the strategic balance disruption in the region. So the message that France and the European Union can bring to this part of the world seems to me to be even more relevant today in the AUKUS context. We do not approach the Indo-Pacific and the challenges at play in the Indo-Pacific from a confrontational angle. Uh, our vision is multidimensional based on the recognition that we must address all the challenges, security challenges, of course, but also economic challenges, development challenges, and global issues such as the fight against climate change and the protection of biodiversity. We have a, a problem with the AUKUS uh, approach because Precisely, it prioritizes military com competition, which in our view uh, can lead to increased tensions in the region as opposed to a multi-dimensional approach that takes into account possible cooperations. Our vision is also multipolar. We do not want to be drawn into an exclusive competition between the US and China, and I think that is also the approach that we share with most countries in the Indo-Pacific who do not want to be forced to choose. One thing is clear also that it is, doesn't mean that uh, we want an equidistance between Washington and, and Beijing. China is a serious competitor and this competition may lead us to push back when we disagree. And we may differ, we are US ally, on the means to promote peace and stability in the region. We can also work with China whenever it is possible on climate change, for instance, or on seeking a common framework for debt reduction. These are two examples. Now a few remarks about the EU dimension. Both the contents and the timing of the AUKUS announcement may have given the impression that the EU was being sidelined and it is not the case. The EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific is a major milestone. And as you know, France has worked very hard to deliver this result. And the level of ambition of this uh, joint communication uh, of the strategy is very high and it is a comprehensive document. Of course, implementation will be key, but I'm confident that the EU 
strategy's impact will be significant. So there is no such thing as demobilization of the EU as a result of the AUKUS announcement. For us, AUKUS was a kind of wake-up call. It also demonstrates that the EU has its own interests and its own approach. And as I said before, there are cases when we may have a different approach from our US ally. All the more necessary then that we should coordinate closely with the US in order to be complementary in the implementation of our Indo-Pacific strategy. As I said before, the EU message to the Indo-Pacific, the message that we can bring is even more relevant in the AUKUS context. Multilateralism is uh, one of our messages and it's a tool to reduce tensions and develop cooperative approaches. And it has been the practice of ASEAN for many years. I will come back to this later. So the French EU presidency will put us during the first half of the year in a good position to launch the implementation of the EU Indo-Pacific strategy. We want to make the Indo-Pacific one of our top priorities during the six month period and we shall work closely with the EU institutions and with the two next presidency, the Czech Republic and Sweden to achieve that. We'll make sure that we build a good momentum. And during our presidency, our intention is to focus our efforts on connectivity and digital challenges, on global challenges, particularly climate change and oceans sustainable management and on security. So now um, in a few minutes, I would like to offer some remarks on our close similarities with ASEAN. We fully recognize the centrality of ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific. Our support for the concept um, of uh, centrality is clearly expressed in the EU strategy paper. And there is no architecture in this part of the world, of course, but that can be compared to uh, what we have achieved in Europe over the last century. But ASEAN has provided for many years a very effective platform of dialogue in order to address regional security issues and regional cooperation. The high value of ASEAN is recognized by all. And as I noted earlier, both the EU and ASEAN are fully committed to multilateralism. Neither of us want to be drawn into a bipolar game between the US and China. It is not an easy position, but it is one we chose because of our values and our principles. And I observed also that we have now a fair degree of convergence with a number of ASEAN countries as to the impact of AUKUS on the region. I saw the expression of some reservations about AUKUS that are very similar to our own analysis. So one can say that AUKUS has further reinforced our convergence. And the strategic partnership, which was mentioned between the EU uh, and ASEAN is the perfect framework for strengthening our cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. The EU and France are, as I, I believe, partners of choice for ASEAN. There is much we can do together in the Indo-Pacific to reduce tensions, develop cooperative dialogue, and try and create more confidence. The three topics that will be discussed in the sessions of this dialogue are perfect examples of sensitive issues for which cooperative and open approaches are needed. And of course, and that would be my concluding remark, France will play its full role in consolidating the EU-ASEAN cooperation through the bilateral partnerships that we have with the countries of the region and through the cooperations that we have developed with ASEAN and particularly through the development partnership that we concluded in September last year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. We now invite Ambassador Ivona Piorko, Ambassador of the European Union to Singapore, to deliver her opening remarks. Ambassador Piorko, please. Hello. 
Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. This is indeed an extremely timely event and um, uh, well thought through. Uh, it is obviously very challenging to be speaking after such three distinguished speakers and being left with three minutes, <laughs> I'll still take up the challenge. Um, I am here in Singapore since two months uh, on week by, by now. But I have to say, even in these two months, um, I have seen the depth of, uh, uh, of links we have between the European Union and Singapore and ASEAN region more broadly, uh, very clearly. Uh, I see it really every day or almost every hour uh, in any activity we, uh, we encounter here. This is probably because basically at the very basic level, European Union and ASEAN are very natural partners. We have been both born as peaceful projects. Uh, I have had fascinating discussions here with ASEAN ambassadors, ambassadors from ASEAN countries. And this very notion came very strongly. ASEAN is now composed of countries that at some point in time were in conflicts. And that is exactly the same with the European Union, which was basically born uh, in the same context. And I think our French colleagues know this, know this particularly well. Uh, we are natural partners also now, nowadays, because we both believe in what is open, multilateral, inclusive world order and security architecture, economic architecture with WTO, et cetera. And um, we, we promote that openness uh, and inclusiveness uh, together in, in various, various strands. So it's obviously no accident, no accident, although it has taken decades and former Secretary General knows this very well uh, to become these strategic partners. And that's why we have to cherish that notion so much. This, at least for the European Union, is the highest level of partnership uh, that we actually have strategic partnership. And we are feeling this with very concrete substance every day. And I really very much like the expression your ambassador used about the community expanding tools and, and, and instruments. I think it's a, it's a beautiful way to put it. I think indeed that we are strongest. That's where we are strongest. That's we want to share, that, that's, that is the part we want to share maybe, maybe most, although not all. And uh, the Indo-Pacific region, uh, a bit bigger than, than ASEAN, although for us, ASEAN is clearly at its core to, with its uh, centrality, um, is for us very important. It has become clearly the center of gravity of the world. And that is the main reason why the EU has put forward its uh, cooperation, its strategy for cooperation in Indo-Pacific not as an answer to AUKUS or anything else, but as an expression of our genuine conviction. And um, I want to really very much stress the word from the title because all the substance of strategy stands very much behind the title. It's strategy for cooperation in Indo-Pacific. Um, a lot has been said, so I don't want to dwell about it too much, but as every basically implementation, uh, you know, uh, program of that kind, it has been um, divided into seven areas of very, very concrete ideas for cooperation in digital, ocean governance, security and defense, human security, health, trade, and so on and so forth, climate, of course. So this is what, uh, what we are now very, very busy with. Um, I was once asked to summarize the strategy in one phrase, and I would repeat the same. It is basically one big genuine invitation to all the partners in the region, very different partners, to cooperate with us at various level, levels to do two things. First, to together with us, address the challenges, the global challenges at hand, at hand and well, there are many. You've been talking here, for instance, about trade. Of course, um, the Indo-Pacific and the European Union uh, trade exchanges are actually the biggest in the world. 2019, before the, the pandemic, they were at the level of uh, 1.5 trillion euros per year. 
And indeed, there is a lot of tension in the region, in the region on maritime routes, on global value chains, and so on. So our core interests are obviously at stake. These core interests that are vi so visible and so tangible, but equally those that sometimes are difficult to be perceived as such, but they are even more important maybe like climate change. This very region unfortunately produces a lot of emissions, but at the same time, it would be the region that would benefit most from, from really addressing that global change very, very strongly. And we hope for cooperation in this last week also ahead of COP26. So there's lots of reasons why we need to cooperate. And the only answer to these global challenges is to cooperate together. And the second thing, what we want to go to, to do together with this strategy is to shape together international uh, rules-based order in trade, security, and, and other areas for the benefit of, of, of us all. Um, I'll, I'll finish with, with drawing a bit of lessons from the COVID crisis. Uh, you know, never, never miss a good crisis. That's clearly one. And if there's one lesson that COVID has taught us all is precisely on how interdependent we are, how sometimes vulnerable we are, but also that the only way forward is really to cooperate and to address them together. I think vaccine production is clearly a very tangible example, but there are many, many others. And uh, I would quote um, High Representative Borrell who uh, put forward um, an interesting op-ed here in Singapore last week in Straight Times, and where he said, what we want to do with the Indo-Pacific strategy is to create links and not dependencies. And for me, that's, that's what strategic autonomy is all about. It is, uh, it is really about starting with ourselves, making ourselves stronger, but in full consultation, openness and, and embracing everybody else who, who, who base themselves on the same universal values and, 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 and joint interests. Um, and our leaders uh, have recently discussed this quite in depth at the European Council. And their main conclusion was strong uh, allies make for strong alliances. And I think this is really what the open strategic autonomy is, is for us. Uh, and indeed, I see echoes of the same sort of thinking in, uh, uh, in ASEAN right now. And, and, and this is a very innovative way of putting how you frame it for this seminar. So I'm very much looking forward to listening to the, to the panels ahead of us. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Before we begin the panel sessions, please note that you can post your questions via the Q&A function. The chat and the raise hand functions are disabled. The first panel on where do critical interests lie in the maritime domain will be moderated by Professor Ralph Emmers, Dean of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies and President's Chair in International Relations at the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Over to you, Prof. Emmers. Thank you very much, Amalina. I hope everybody can hear me well. Uh, we've already had uh, a lot of food for thought in this first panel, in the first introductory session. And I very much look forward to applying uh, some of those ideas and concepts, of course, uh, related to ASEAN re resilience and the European strategic autonomy to the maritime domain. To do so, we are very fortunate uh, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're joining us, to have three wonderful um, speakers. We will welcome uh, in a minute Professor Jeffrey Till, who is an advisor to the Maritime Security Program at uh, RSIS here in Singapore. His entire bio is, of course, included in, in uh, the electronic booklet, so I won't say more, but uh, invite you to go and read uh, it in detail. The same would, of course, apply to Admiral Christoph Pazuk, who is the director of the Institute of the Ocean at uh, l'Université de Sorbonne, Sorbonne University Alliance in, in Paris. Both uh, Professor Till and Admiral Pazuk will give us a Southeast Asian as well as a European perspective on some of those concepts, and then I will invite uh, my, my good friend, Dr. Safia Mouhibat, 
who is the head of the Department of International Relations at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Jakarta, to bring those two perspectives together and perhaps uh, kickstart uh, a conversation by comparing and contrasting those strategic contexts. So with no further ado, as mentioned previously, I'm gonna invite the speakers to speak for 10 minutes, the discussion for five. So I will now pass on the floor to Professor Jeffrey Till. Jeff, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Oops. Wait a minute. Right. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start my 10 minutes uh, talking about critical interest in the maritime domain with a quotation by the British geographer Helford Mackinder shortly before the First World War. His insight was that the sea is all joined up. In effect, what the Russians call the world ocean, a borderless place with few frontiers. The implications of that means that every, anything that happens anywhere in the world ocean will have an impact on everywhere else. Modern developments have reinforced that point. These include environmental degradation and climate change, the centrality of the sea lines of communication that are the basis of the globalization on which we all depend for our peace and our prosperity. The impact of transnational crime at sea. The increasing range of the technology of military power. And the international impacts of instability and conflict almost wherever it is. Even the law of the sea has this effect, as what is decided in one place establishes a precedent for all the others. We are all affected by this in Southeast Asia, in Europe, and in the rest of the world as well. Everywhere has interests everywhere else. Interdependence effectively constrains everyone's ability to opt out. It sets limits on the extent to which any country or region can pursue a policy of pure autonomy in the maritime domain. Instead, it will be a question of nuance, compromise and shared effort. So when talking about maritime security, what does this actually mean? The overall issue in all parts of the world ocean is maritime security. And the key word here is security, uh, a concept which has widened considerably since the end of the Cold War. And there seem to me to be three separate but connected dimensions to the concept of maritime security, together with a battery of necessarily associated actions. The first is the issue of safety the safety of individuals, groups, from insentient, impersonal threats like navigational hazards, pandemics, and catastrophic climate change. While there is no one here consciously meaning harm, it can happen anyway, and quite possibly on an enormous scale. It is in the common interest, therefore, to contain these threats. The task here is to monitor developments, enforce relevant regulations, respond to the urgent needs of victims, and maybe pick up the pieces afterwards. The imperative is to cooperate and build capacity where it's lacking, and to ensure our own behavior, procedures, and equipment do not make the situation worse. Since an effective response is likely to require costly protocols, procedures, and changes in human behavior, their enforcement is neither easy, cheap, 
nor without controversy. The second dimension is security. Um, good order at sea is threatened, sometimes severely, by non-state actors who do mean to engage in harmful acts at the human state, regional, and even global level. They include terrorists and criminals of every sort, drugs and people smugglers, pirates, and so forth. Because of the human misery such activities can cause and the threats to local and regional stability that can ensue, there are again ample reasons for multinational naval cooperation and Coast Guard cooperation to exchange information, better still intelligence, to increase maritime domain awareness and to work together in an ascending scale that ranges from deconfliction through coordinated responses to full, seamless, and routine cooperation at the top end of the scale. It is obviously best when such cooperation is a habit, a permanent habit, not just a bespoke project for a particular time and place. The third dimension is defense against hostile state action, against threats posed by other states against one's territory, sovereignty, or core maritime strategic interests. It's the last of the three dimensions of maritime security and of course, the most traditional. These conventional state-based threats can range from military or in its place, economic maritime pressure intimidation, outright confrontation through to various degrees of employed force. The national response, both in Southeast Asia and in Europe, is the preparation and deployment of naval and associated military forces prepared to fight the conflicts they cannot deter. It also calls for military cooperation between the like-minded, which in turn, leads to cooperation against the unlike-minded. The problem with this is that it poses choices. The requirements of these three dimensions of maritime security can conflict and pose policy choices. The first two are largely about cooperation at sea. The third, more about competition. And I would emphasize that these are not binary not a matter of either or. The two can be pursued alongside each other, but they certainly add complexity. The issue is to strike a balance between them that the countries of Europe and Southeast Asia will find sustainable in the long run. And that means identifying what the critical challenges to their maritime interests actually are and agreeing a way forwards. And there seem to me to be three of them. The first is climate change, which has already been mentioned. I think I don't need to labour the point about the importance of dealing with this, especially in the run up to COP26. I would say the second major issue, the second critical threat at sea that we need to deal with is transnational crime. Uh, this has been admirably reviewed, I think, in, in a book that I uh, recommend to all of my students, um, The Outlaw Ocean. In this, Ian Orbina um, argues effectively that the problem is actually getting worse. Um, the degree to which regulation and the enforcement of that regulation against all forms of international crime um, is not keeping pace with the growth of that degree of threat. And both of them, the business of monitoring what's going on, the ability to enforce regulation, um, require cooperation. Neither of these two things are easy. Um, climate change and transnational crime together, taken together, both require compromise and center on cooperation.
The third dimension, though, is trickier. And that is clearly the problem of unrestrained competition between great powers in particular, but also between minor powers too, a point that we should not forget because the latter can lead to the former. Competition at sea only gets dangerous when it gets destabilizing. And we are in a new, unfamiliar and potentially threatening world. In the second decade of this century, for the first time in 400 years, East Asia spent more on naval power than did Europe. The resultant convulsions in the international maritime order therefore have to be accommodated. We are in a new world. And perhaps it's inevitable that there is a degree of jockeying for position in a new unfamiliar world order. We should expect it. Competition has to be accepted, therefore, but it needs to be restrained. There is a need even here for a degree, or well, perhaps especially here, for a degree of cooperation um, against what might otherwise happen. And here there might well be tensions between the interests and policies of outsiders in Southeast Asia and insiders if only because the presence of the latter is fixed and geographic, but that of the former is discretionary, a matter of choice. Nor do the mutual suspicions of the main players, United States, China, India, Russia, Japan, and Europe, as they inevitably play out at sea, make the situation any easier. Unlike in a Cold War period, there are a few institutional restraints on behavior, but there are a lot of behavioral rules of the game, if you like, like, for example, the Q's regulation that's recently been agreed. However, the fact that the chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff can apparently phone up his opposite number in China to reassure him about US intentions and be believed suggests that these relationships can be managed, provided all concerned behave professionally and cooperatively. But of course, we should remember that the Republicans criticized him for taking the action that he did. There is a problem here. There will be limits to cooperation. So what are my conclusions uh, to all of this? In part, because of COVID, because of the growth of nationalism that I think we see everywhere in the world to a greater or lesser extent, there is a move towards increasing economic autarky, to a certain extent away from the basic propositions of globalization that informed behavior for the previous 20 years. A desire for separateness, a desire for the maintenance of independent decision. In maritime security, it seems to me, we should be looking for commonality, not distinctiveness. There's too much distinctiveness, arguably, in Europe, too much distinctiveness in Southeast Asia already. What instead is required, seems to me, uh, to be more cooperation against common threats, when dealing with threats to maritime security, in other words, the search for strategic autonomy, in other words, could be more of a problem than a solution. And we need to be sure that it isn't. I started with one quotation, and I will end with another, much less formal. We are all in the same boat, and the need to cooperate rather than pretend we are not the need to focus on convergence rather than divergence is what seems to me essentially to be called for and something that is recognized both in Southeast Asia uh, and in Europe. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. Um, let me now invite Admiral Christoph Puzzle to share his views. Hello. Thank you, Professor Emmers. I'm Christoph Pazuk. I'm uh... I'm the director of the Ocean Institute in Sorbonne University in Paris. 
And prior to this position, I was the chief of the French Navy from 2016 to 2020. In the following 10 minutes, I will try to answer briefly the question, what is strategic autonomy in the maritime domain? In France, the concept of strategic autonomy has deep roots in our history. Between 1870 and 1940, France has been invaded three times. Despite alliances and treaties, never again would be a fair reason to explain our appetite for strategic autonomy. As mentioned by ambassadors Abansou and Penaud, strategic autonomy could be applied to many fields, economy, technology, sciences, climate, diplomacy. I will concentrate on military and maritime affairs and discuss two important goals of strategic autonomy. The first goal is the necessity to protect our vital interest alone if needed. Autonomy in defending our vital interest alone if needed is based on a full spectrum armed forces from nuclear deterrence to constabulary missions. The second goal is to provide to our political authorities independent assessments on strategic situations. On the ground of these independent assessments, they will take independent political decisions. Autonomy on the, in the decision-making process is based on intelligence. So I will start with a few words on our vital interests, which are the first goal of our strategic, of strategic autonomy. The responsibility of defining what we specifically call vital interest belongs to our chief of state. They are never clearly defined. Uncertainty is a condition of their efficiency. However, regularly, every four to five years, the chief of state, the president of France, pronounces a speech where he uh, uh, talk about nuclear deterrent, and he gives some considerations on vital interests. During the Cold War, France's territory and population represented our vital interests, threatened by a Soviet invasion of Western Europe. 16 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 2006, President Chirac mentioned strategic flows among our vital interests. These strategic flows certainly included some maritime flows, since they are a condition of our way of life and prosperity. This was probably the first time a French president took this very maritime perspective and including flows in a speech partly dedicated to our vital interests. Today, data flows pouring in and out numerical cables are essential to our economies and societies. I have no doubt that they enrich the list of the critical assets we need to protect. The maritime dimension of our vital interest appears also in the way we protect them with our strategic submarines. Our second strike capability have been continuously relying on at least one strategic submarine operational in petrol at sea during the last 38,000 days, that is since February 1972. Maritime flows are critical to our security and prosperity. We protect our vital interest with the most powerful of our naval assets, our strategic submarines. We do believe this has a direct impact on the security of Europe the security of our neighbors and European partners determines our own security. A few words now on the decision-making process. The second goal of strategic autonomy I, cho I chose to, to talk about. In 1991, 10,000 French soldiers were involved in the Operation Desert Storm in order to liberate Kuwait invited by Saddam Hussein. At that time, no one knew the real capabilities 
of the Iraqi army, the third army in the world, according to the media. It was unclear if the Iraqi army would oppose strong resistance, use chemical weapons, ballistic missiles, etc. Casualties were probable in the ranks of the coalition. Our political masters, liable of the lives of the French soldiers before the country, realized that their decisions could only rely on the military assessment of the coalition, i.e. US intelligence. Fortunately, the overwhelming superiority of the coalition forces in the air and on the ground provided victory. Nonetheless, a deep reform of the French armed forces was promptly decided after the liberation of Kuwait. <clears throat> its main objective was to build a capability of independent assessment in crisis time. It reinforced joint operational command, satellite intelligence, joint military intelligence, joint special operations. 12 years later, in 2003, this specific capability supported President Chirac's decision to refuse to participate in the invasion of Iraq. History proved his decision was wise and sound. Intelligence systems and agencies are, play a major role here, but navies are an extremely valuable tool in the quest for information. Through the ocean, we are neighbors of the vast majority of the countries of the world. Our ships have been collecting intelligence for years of Syria, for example. Thanks to the freedom of navigation, we've been able to monitor a large part of the air and electronic activity above the Syrian territory where ISIS was planning terrorist attack against France. This maritime data added to human sources, satellite data, other military sources contributed to build and maintain on a continuous pace an assessment on what was going on when Turkish missiles destroyed a Russian fighter, when Syrian air defense shot down a Russian maritime patrol aircraft, when we struck chemical weapons storage sites along with our US and British allies. In the Indo-Pacific region, our regular patrols with frigate, frigates, aircraft and submarines provide a continuously updated assessment on some fast evolving maritime theaters such as the South China Sea. Along with diplomatic and economic assessment, this knowledge allowed us to produce a French Indo-Pacific strategy, which is itself contributed, among other contributions, to the design of a European Indo-Pacific strategy. Participate into alliances, contrib contribute to the definition of their policy, cooperate with partners, choose your fight, choose your strategy, choose your courses of action. These are the objectives of strategic autonomy in the decision-making process. This is what we are building with our European partners. I would be delighted to answer your question later, elaborate further on strategic autonomy and maritime critical interest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Admiral Prozuk. It is now uh, Fifi's easy task to try to bridge the, the two presentations in the two regions. The floor is yours, Fifi. Thank you so much, um, Ralph. Um, not an easy task um, indeed. Um, I uh, very much enjoyed um, the discussion so far today, earlier in the opening remarks and also um, in the session with the two um, distinguished speakers. Um, listening to all you know, the speakers um, since the um, opening remarks, um, it is you know, very apparent that um, the EU and, and ASEAN or Europe and Southeast Asia share a lot of um, similarities with regards to its interest in upholding uh, maritime security uh, and order at sea. Um, it, we are uh, in a situation where the needed um, documents are there. Um, the EU recognizes ASEAN centrality, while at the same time, you know, ASEAN um, strongly upholds um, its principles of centrality. Um, um, both um, uphold multilateralism, uh, um, you know, despite of certain um, policies from um, certain countries that might be a little bit uh, different from one to the other. But um, both um, organizations, the EU and, and ASEAN, uphold multilaterality, multilateralism, 
and has um, strongly stated that neither wants to be drawn to either side of the U.S. or China. So in, in, in this regard, you know, um, you, you do see um, a lot of um, similarities. Um, you know, both um, speakers just now um, also express uh, the need to uh, maintain um, this, um, this particular issue. Professor Till, for example, explained about, you know, uh, the, the, the danger of unrestrained competition, while uh, Admiral Prazuk um, also, you know, basically laid out the importance of um, strategic autonomy. Now, but what is what is um, interesting um, is that you know when, when you talk about you know, maritime maritime domain, um, it's um, it's going to be continuously difficult to actually um, pinpoint the, the correct strategy that might work for both um, sides, the European and and, and Southeast Asians. Um, looking at from the Southeast Asian perspective, I think. Uh, it, this is already a very diffi difficult for us in Southeast Asia to actually come up with the right strategy for all 10 ASEAN member countries. So to put um, um, uh, an, an, um, an additional um, sort of like um, external uh, actors uh, perspective into it is going to be uh, um, even more difficult. Um, I think to put some things into perspective, I mean, um, ASEAN countries have worked together with a lot of external uh, partners um, to maintain maritime security. We work together with, with Japan, with Korea, uh, with the US, of course, with Australia, and um, for the longest time also with uh, European countries. Um, but we are still lacking sort of like the, co the comprehensive strategy. Um, and a lot of these types of cooperation with different countries are still uh, at times overlapping one or the other. So we're not getting um, the full benefit of this um, types of cooperation with a lot of countries, including countries um, in Europe. So, you know, even though there are um, a lot of, you know, commonalities, similar interests, similar concerns, we talked about, um, Professor Till talked about the, um, the challenges, the important issues, uh, transnational crime, climate change, those are both um, um, issues that are recognized by both uh, Europeans and Southeast Asians are, uh, are uh, important issues with regards to maritime security. Um, and, and both have also recognized, as Professor Till mentioned, that regulations and enforcement are not keeping pace with the growth of the, or the degree of the threat. Something that is uh, even more apparent uh, when you look at some of the Southeast Asian states that are still lacking in terms of naval capability. So um, even uh, so, even that you know we are still uh, not uh, in a situation where we should be sort of like um, formulating the right strategy that would actually benefit both uh, the Southeast Asian countries and and the European countries, uh, which you know um, looking at the various uh, Indo-Pacific strategy coming out of um, uh, coming out of Europe. Um, they are um, very much um, interested into playing um, a bigger role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, so um, having said that, you know, um, I, I think the, um, the, the challenge is, I think we're past the challenge of um, trying to list uh, the, uh, the issues that uh, Europe and Southeast Asian states um, have similar concerns of. Um, I think that uh, we acknowledge that there are uh, a, a lot of maritime security threats that we, rec we both recognize um, as important challenges. Uh, I think the challenge now is actually coming up with the, with the strategy to actually um, um, push for a closer cooperation within Europe uh, and Southeast Asia. And again, from the Southeast Asian perspective, um, the, 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 also the real challenge is that we, we're not lacking of the, the, uh, the amount or, or the degree of cooperation with external uh, partners or dialogue partners of ASEAN. Uh, as I mentioned, um, that there are already too many in the list uh, of various uh, cooperation with a lot of dialogue partners of ASEAN. But what we are lacking is um, still uh, the ability to make sure that this um, cooperation do not overlap and we can actually benefit from, from each of the dialogue partners uh, of ASEAN. I think I'll, I'll stop here, um, uh, Rolf. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fifi. I will, the questions are starting to come in on the feed, which is great, but I would like to give uh, both Professor uh, Jeffrey Till as well as uh, Admiral Christoph Brazuk an opportunity to respond 
to uh, Dr. Muhibat's uh, comments, but also perhaps to respond to one another if you so desire. So, uh, Jeff, may I pass the floor back to you first, following the order of presentations? Uh, yes, indeed, Ralph. Th thank you very much. Um, I ab absolutely agree with everything that the Admiral said, and I would really underline the point he was making about the importance of maritime domain awareness and the role that navies and coast guards have in trying to ensure that we all know what is going on at sea. And it seems to me that this is an area of real challenge, partly because of the sheer scale of activity and knowing precisely what's happening, why it's happening, where it might happen in the future and so on, um, seems to me to be an eminent justification for the construction of Coast Guard and Naval forces and for their um, constructive role in that region. So I absolutely agree with, with, with what he said there. And it does link in with one of the questions which I saw um, being floated by our audience. And then our, that is referring to the dangers, if you like, of ambiguity, of strategic ambiguity. And that and the questioner was was really addressing the issue of um, what do we what do, what do we think and how should we respond to uh, the use of um, fishing forces as a kind of maritime militia. And it, it seems to me that the problem there is that what we're dealing facing with is the situation where countries are resorting to ambiguity in preference for taking the risks of outright confrontation. And that seems to me to be extremely dangerous because it's hiding in ambiguity and that it clashes with our ability to know what's going on and to be able to define what is the logical and safe way of trying to deal with uh, potential threats to security. So my, it seems to me to reinforce what the Admiral was saying about the importance of knowing uh, what's actually going on at sea. And this is an interest that everybody in Southeast Asia and everybody in Europe um, have a common interest in doing. I think I'd leave it at that, but there are lots of other things that the Admiral said that um, I absolutely would sign up to. Thank you very much. Um, Admiral, um, an immediate response before we move on to the questions in the chat, perhaps. Yes, thank you very much. I, I have the feeling that I, 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 was, uh, uh, I was referring to, to uh, um, very military uh, uh, notions and concepts. Uh, and Professor Thiel's uh, uh, intervention was uh, uh, really uh, uh, um, excellent and, and, and gave some other angles on the maritime domain. Uh, um, just a few words on, on uh, um, where, where, where can you cooperate on the sea? Is, the, is everything on the sea, on the oceans, the same thing? In fact, you have uh, uh, not all the ocean is interesting. Uh, for economic reasons, for example, you have spots, slocks, and stocks. Spots are the choke points, the Malacca Straits, uh, the Ormu Straits. These are the places where it's easier to disrupt the, the economic flows. Uh, slocks, the sea lines of communications, are just like the, 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 the submarine cables, are, are also places where, like the pirates of Somalia, where you can uh, uh, have with few uh, uh, few assets have a, a, a great impact on uh, uh, the, the maritime economy and stocks, it's uh, stocks of fishes or, or EEZ, uh, all the places where you have uh, uh, oil, gas, fish, and, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> stocks of the, uh, uh, that can be, uh, that can have a, a, an economic interest. So these are the places where cooperation could be concentrated. And this is the case, for example, in Singapore with the uh, 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 specific center for the fusion center to uh, uh, organize the, uh, the maritime security, especially against the piracy. Uh, the second thing, so these are where cooperation can be enhanced 
uh, the, so rather around spots, slogs, and stocks. And the second thing is with for, for which mission? And Professor Thiel mentioned uh, uh, HADR, Human Assistance and Disaster Relief, uh, uh, which will be increasing in the following years uh, uh, because of the climate change and with stronger cyclones and hurricanes. And generally, when you have several countries, several navies around a, a, a piece of, uh, uh, of ocean, and you want to have them cooperate on something that everyone will agree, HADR is a very good door to start uh, a cooperation, then constabulary mission before speaking of military missions. Thank you very much. Let me now move on to the to the feed, and I'm happy to say that some some questions have come in. I believe uh, Professor Till has already answered the question on the South China Sea and the mar maritime militia, but there is a specific question for you, uh, Jeff, and then I will ask one specific question also to the Admiral. So, question from Sophie Perrault. Uh, you seem in your conclusion to suggest that seeking autonomy would be in contradiction with the need for cooperation. Is there a contradiction between the two? Are they mutually exclusive? Or can autonomy be achieved while still seeking cooperation? And for you, Admiral Prazuk, France, and here I quote uh, Frederick Klim, France has an obvious advantage in the Indo-Pacific, especially in the maritime domain. In fact, it is the only EU country that can make a meaningful difference in that space. In terms of maritime security, what is the added value of embedding Fran French maritime security policy in an EU framework? Why not go fully unilateral in terms of maritime security and only seeking an EU framework when there is a significant value? Uh, a nicely politically charged question there for you, uh, um, Admiral. So uh, Jeff, why don't we start with you again and then we'll, we'll follow the order of the presentations. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ralph. Yes, I, I, the, it was an interesting question. Um, I was trying to make the point in my little talk that I don't think um, either the countries of Southeast Asia or the countries of Europe face a binary choice between um, either confrontation or cooperation, um, between um, strategic autonomy which I would define as basically um, preserving the independence of decision, preserving the independence of your capacity to know what your particular interests are, and the need to uh, cooperate with others. Um, so I think I would summarize my position really, um, really by echoing what the Admiral said about the importance for countries in practical terms of being able to preserve essentially their sovereignty over what's in their interests. Um, but having said that, um, what is in their interests is fundamentally to avoid conflict um, where it's avoidable. So it's those current phrases that one hears in the media uh, all the time really, together if we can, alone if we must, cooperate where we can, um, confront where we must. And it seems to me that that balance is a complementary one, not a mutually exclusive one. There are huge areas in which we simply have to cooperate because it's in the interests, the critical interests of every state to do so. But there are also issues where those state interests do conflict and uh, to a degree but even there we need to restrain the degree to which uh, those that difference of interest could lead to a uh, confrontation admiral well i totally share the the views of professor teal on on uh, the question of uh, uh, autonomy and alliances. I think you, you, you need the, you, you can do the both and it's necessary. And about uh, why, why don't we go unilateral? Uh, because, uh, uh, well, alone you go faster and uh, uh, in an alliance you go further, uh, uh, as it's usually said, because uh, what, what is our advantage? Our advantage in the Indo-Pacific is uh, 
that we have uh, 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 pieces of France that are in the Indo-Pacific region, R Reunion Island, New Caledonia, and uh, 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 French Polynesia, which is about 2 million people. Uh, so we are uh, in these oceans, uh, uh, but our difficulty, our limits are the size of our assets. And, uh, and uh, we had we, we don't have a permanent presence, for example, in the hotspot of the region, like uh, 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 South China Sea. And we have the previous experience, for example, of, of uh, uh, monitoring and fighting and, uh, and uh, preventing piracy of Somalia. And uh, we started alone or with other countries. And now there, there has been, uh, for more than 10, 10 years, a European mission there, Atalanta. Uh, which is very efficient, and uh, we are sharing the burden with our, our European allies. And it's very clear that uh, uh, without this sharing, we couldn't we couldn't have a permanent presence. Uh, we couldn't have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the same the same efficiency. We are doing the same thing in the Ormuz Strait uh, with the Emaso mission. So we know this is uh, uh, an efficient way of doing things going along with our Euro, uh, with our european partners it may be longer to start but it's really uh, extremely powerful thank you um i have three questions that i would like you to address and uh, fifi i'll bring you into the conversation there is no free lunch as we say although i'm not even buying you lunch so uh, but a question for you i think which uh, you will enjoy addressing is Playing the devil's advocate, this person argues, is, is ASEAN really the best, most efficient partner for the European Union to try to protect critical interests in, in the region? Let's, let's focus the conversation specifically on the maritime domain. ASEAN as an organization here, uh, understood to be an organization rather than the Southeast Asian region, is it really the right platform for the EU to try to, to look at its core interests in the maritime domain in Southeast Asia. Admiral, the second question will come to you, and it is about the best strategy for the gray zone operations, especially in the South China Sea, ships of Coast Guard and navies collided with each other, which led to escalation. How does a state behave to avoid unnecessary escalation? Finally, uh, Jeff, we all expected an AUKUS question, and here it is. Uh, the question <laughs> is, um, to what extent do we see long-term lasting damage, uh, especially at the bilateral and trilateral level between, on the one hand, France, and on the other, uh, the, the, the three countries that constitute uh, AUKUS in, in, in the Indo-Pacific? So, Fifi, I'll, I'll turn the floor to you first. Sure, thank you so much, um, Ralph. Um, and I'm going to be asking you for the lunch um, later on. But um, uh, yeah, um, so, uh, but I think this question can be asked um, not only regarding the EU, but every other, you know, dialogue partners of ASEAN. You know, the question is, would ASEAN be the, the best or most efficient um, partner to, you know, for, for a lot of issues, but we're talking about maritime security issues. Um, I think if, if you're looking for credibility, then yes. If you want to push for multilateralism, yes. If you want to handle maritime security, um, sort of like on the big picture, um, putting up statements to show that uh, it's uh, the maritime security of East, uh, of East Asia or in the Pacific is part of your um, uh, whole strategy, then absolutely yes. You need a, a vehicle uh, like ASEAN um, to be able to be credible into saying all of these um, statements. Uh, but, with, when, but when you want to address very specific issues, this is, I think, where you know, cooperation with um, regional organizations like ASEAN uh, is lacking. You can't really go into uh, specific details uh, of, of, of maritime security issues. Uh, on uh, especially on the things where you know uh, bilateral cooperation might actually um, be be more useful or beneficial to to a lot of countries. So I think the challenge uh, for the EU and a lot of um, ASEAN dialogue partners is actually to um, to indicate you know what sort of issues you want to focus on and to be able to identify 
which channel would be best to address this particular issue that you're interested in. Like I said, if you want a big picture, if you want to uh, uh, show yourself as a credible actor uh, in the maritime domain in the Indo-Pacific, then yes, you definitely need um, ASEAN to do so. But if you want to go into details, more specific issues, then you know, uh, bilateral country to country agreements uh, is unfortunately would be more efficient. Thank you for your candid uh, response, Admiral. How should we deal with um, gray zone operations? <laughs> uh, uh, well, gray zone operations are the principle of gray zone operation is that the aggressor stay below two thresholds, the thresholds of aggression. It's not an aggression, a threshold of attribution. There is an aggression, but no one knows who, who did it or no one can prove it or no one has any interest in, in, in in knowing it or, or, or naming it, naming the aggressor. So in uh, South China Sea, it's really, uh, it's more uh, uh, staying under the fresh hold of aggression. But what can be seen during the last years is that this threshold is being, is going up years after years, month after month. And that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the action are more and more aggressive. And how could we avoid them? Well, I'm, uh, 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 there are several, well, tactical means of uh, uh, sending bigger ships or uh, or uh, being paying more attention to uh, to to what uh, the uh, the counterpart is doing. This this was a great game during the Cold War. Collision between ships in the Norwegian Sea or in the Black Sea was uh, very common during the the Cold War, and so uh, 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 you. You can choose to give this some political uh, 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 reason or some political uh, 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 ground, or you can choose not to, or you can name and shame. You have all, all a, a spectrum of answers on uh, um, after the tactical uh, uh, level, on the strategic level or a political level in order to counter your, uh, uh, the, your competitor. But this is a competition and you have to find ways you don't want to escalate. So you have to be more imaginative than the, the person who is uh, in front of you. It's very, uh, uh, um, uh, I would say first, uh, uh, there is a goal, it's, there is a strategy. So you have to think about how to counter this strategy without escalating. Okay, but there is no, it's not automatic to escalate after a collision between two ships. Thank you, Admiral. Um, Jeff, AUKUS, long-term damage or just short-term um, drama? <laughs> I think there is a, a, a deal of short-term drama in it, to, to, to be honest. Um, I think there, there was a, uh, it was a warning shot. It was a warning shot of the necessity to consult. And it seems to me that the manner in which the AUKUS deal was done without consultation with France did actually, um, was actually a mistake, clearly. And in a, in a way, it was the same, apparently, as the American decision to stage the withdrawal from Kabul. Um, it wasn't so much the decision that was taken, it was the manner in which the decision was taken and, and, and then proceeded with, with um, relevant parties only being consulted afterwards. So I think that is uh, a warning um, to um, the US in particular about the limits of unilateralism, that going their own way in that sort of way does more harm than is necessary, shall we, shall we put it like that? And I, I trust that, the, uh, that that warning has been taken, um, but it is a permanent one. And it, it is a permanent kind of implication that there are constraints on free your your autonomy really to act as you as you would wish, and it's a sort of example of the kind of argument I'm making that there are there are real limits to the extent to which you can be totally independent. You have to consult. Um, basically, I think it won't do long term damage at all. Um, I think the storm clouds are, are already receding quite a lot because we, all three countries, have the same fundamental interests um, in the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific region. 
Um, some of their methods might slightly differ, but basically speaking, they all, all have the same aims and they all have the same needs. And I think this is very evident indeed in another area, and that is um, the business of carriers. Um, one gathers that in the recent discussions between um, the two presidents, um, the topic of the new French carrier came up. And we all know that um, between the British and the French, there have been a lot of cooperation about carrier development and that the United States and France are talking very actively about the help that might be provided uh, for France to get its new carrier uh, sometime in the 2030s and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, none of us can sort these problems out on our own. We, we face a, um, a range of challenges that the force levels that we've all got, all three countries, are inadequate to actually deal with all of them satisfactorily. We simply need to cooperate. And uh, I think that's universally recognised. And so any spats there might be um, are, are just that. They're spats, effectively, um, that uh, spots on the face of heaven, if you like. It fundamentally uh, limit, um, the fundamental requirement is to cooperate. Um, I'd also like to add something to the previous question that the Admiral said about um, how to deal with grey zone operation. One of the issues is rules of engagement. Where you don't know what the situation is, um, it's hard to know what your rules of engagement as a ship commander actually allow you to do. So in a way, we have to think about the provision of rules of engagement that try to deal with ambiguity. And I think that is going to be very difficult. And that's why it's so dangerous. Um, because if you delegate decision downwards to the extent of people engaged in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an incident, um, you do increase the prospect of mistakes. So it is a real danger. And that's really why I was warning uh, against um, states pursuing the deliberate use of ambiguity as a strategic option. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. I would like to give the last uh, the last minute, which we still have, to the admiral uh, to see whether he would agree on his assessment of the long term potential damage or not of uh, of AUKUS sitting in Paris. What would be your perspective? Um, well, I think uh, Ambassador Pono made, made it very clear in his opening remarks about uh, the short term and the long term. Uh, uh, long term, France uh, uh, have interest in the region. France is, uh, 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 is in the Indo-Pacific. France depends on uh, the maritime uh, uh, flows in the uh, Indo-Pacific. France uh, is uh, interested in the uh, uh, rule-based order is in uh, in uh, the respect of the of the law of the sea so for all these reasons uh, 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 economic and, and politics uh, uh, france uh, will be involved uh, it was a, a big surprise for uh, uh, diplomacy but also for military and and, uh, and the navy people i had very strong very regular links with my australian counterpart and i was extremely surprised uh, uh, to to uh, uh, discover uh, this uh, AUKUS decision and uh, but uh, okay we'll do we'll do things differently uh, fortunately with our uh, European allies uh, since uh, now we have a European Indo-Pacific strategy but uh, we'll we'll be there we'll still be there because we need to be there because what's happening in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia uh, has direct impact on our life and prosperity. Thank you very much. It is uh, 4 p.m. hence 10 a.m. in Europe uh, and of course um, 9 a.m. In, 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 in the UK. Thank you, Jeff, for, for waking up so early to join us. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Admiral. Thank you very much, Fifi. This, puts, uh, this brings to an end this first session. I very much enjoyed it. We could have gone for much longer, but we're now moving uh, in the sphere of uh, cyber. So I'll pass the floor back to Amalina first. Thank you very much.